the peak of American consumer culture, shopping malls were more than just places to shop. They were lively social hubs that hosted some of the most cherished and memorable restaurants of their time. From the 1950s to the 1980s, these dining landmarks fulfilled hunger and became integral parts of numerous memories. Fast forward to today and the dining scene in shopping malls has changed significantly. Many of the once famous eateries that characterized a bygone era have disappeared, creating a sense of nostalgia for those who enjoyed the unique charm they provided. Join us as we explore 13 famous mall restaurants that have disappeared. One of the most cherished and well-known mall restaurants in the past was the iconic Harvest House cafeterias. This beloved cafeteria-style eatery held a special place in the hearts of many, offering a diverse menu and a warm, family-friendly atmosphere. Families and friends gathered here to create cherished memories over delicious meals in bustling malls. Imagine a lively mall with Harvest House cafeterias at its culinary center. The inviting aroma of freshly prepared dishes filled the air, attracting visitors with the promise of delightful treats. The cafeteria's extensive menu catered to various tastes, ensuring something for everyone, from the choosiest eaters to the most adventurous palates. The family-friendly atmosphere was the special ingredient that made Harvest House cafeterias more than just a place to eat. It was a space where relationships were strengthened and shared moments became timeless. The sounds of children's laughter, the clinking of utensils, and friendly conversations created an atmosphere that felt like a home away from home. Unfortunately, this once thriving culinary haven has disappeared, leaving only memories behind. Were you intrigued to know the stories behind the disappearance of Kenny Rogers Roasters? Keep watching to find out. In the dynamic world of dining experiences, Kenny Rogers Roasters emerges as a noteworthy disappearance. Established in 1991 by the collaboration of country legend Kenny Rogers and former KFC CEO John Y. Brown Jr., this chicken-focused chain impacted the culinary scene. Introducing Kenny's brand new barbecue chicken, perfectly cooked and basted in a savory sauce. Try our downright kickin' barbecue chicken today. Kenny Rogers Roasters. There's goodness here. Imagine when the inviting scent of perfectly roasted chicken filled the air enticing hungry customers to Kenny Rogers Roasters. Founded by Brown, a former governor of Kentucky and an early investor in Kentucky Fried Chicken, along with Rogers, renowned for his musical talent and commercial work for the Dole Food Company, the restaurant combined expertise with celebrity influence. The partnership between a seasoned business leader and a music icon resulted in a dining experience beyond the ordinary. The restaurant's success wasn't just about its delicious chicken, it embodied entrepreneurial spirit with a touch of celebrity charm. However, like many aspects of life, Kenny Rogers Roasters has become a cherished memory, disappearing from the culinary scene. The echoes of its once vibrant presence remain, prompting reflection on the fleeting nature of even the most beloved establishments. Caramel Corn was a paradise for caramel popcorn enthusiasts who thrived during the bustling mid-century mall boom. Picture yourself leisurely strolling through lively shopping centers, lured by the irresistible aroma of freshly caramelized popcorn emanating from this charming establishment. Dedicating itself to the craft of caramel popcorn, Caramel Corn became a beloved destination, encapsulating the essence of a bygone era. Envision families and friends gathering, sharing smiles and relishing the sweet and crunchy delights that defined Caramel Corn's legacy. As the mid-century mall culture flourished, so did Caramel Corn's popularity. It transcended being merely a snack stop. It became a nostalgic experience intricately woven into the fabric of community outings. The golden age of malls witnessed Caramel Corn ascending as a culinary icon leaving an enduring mark on the collective memories of those who delighted in its delectable treats. In a surprising turn of events, Caramel Corn's journey took an unexpected twist as it joined forces with Dairy Queen and Orange Julius. This merger of beloved brands signaled a harmonious blend of flavors and traditions, creating a culinary synergy that resonated with a new generation. Although the standalone presence of Caramel Corn has dimmed, its legacy of caramel popcorn lives on, interwoven into the historical fabric of mall culture. 
The tale of caramel corn prompts contemplation on the evolution of our culinary landscape, where mergers and collaborations mold how we experience and relish our cherished treats. Ready to explore the mystery behind the disappearance of famous mall restaurants like Morrison's Cafeteria? Stay tuned to discover. Embark on a historical journey to the peak era of Morrison's Cafeterias, a chain of cafeteria-style restaurants that impacted the southeastern United States. With roots in the South, mainly in Georgia and Florida, Morrison's Cafeterias became renowned for their excellent Southern cuisine. Established in 1920 by J.A. Morrison in Mobile, Alabama, Morrison pioneered the cafeteria dining concept, offering more than 100 homemade dishes daily. By 1950, the chain had grown to 17 locations across Mississippi, Alabama, Louisiana, Georgia, Tennessee, and Florida, particularly gaining popularity among retirees. Morrison's cafeterias flourished and became the largest cafeteria chain in the nation. In addition to its dining establishments, the company expanded into catering, securing contracts for significant productions like The Greatest Show on Earth and extending services to schools, universities, corporate dining, and hospitals. Despite its historical success, Morrison's cafeterias faced criticism for maintaining racial segregation during the civil rights movement. In 1964, protests led by John Lewis in Nashville challenged the company's discriminatory practices, which persisted until the company's closure. In the 1980s, new management aimed to diversify by acquiring the Ruby Tuesday chain in 1982. By the mid-1990s, changes in dining preferences prompted Morrison's to split into three entities, Morrison's Fresh Cooking, Ruby Tuesday Incorporation, and Morrison Healthcare. Ultimately, evolving customer expectations contributed to the decline of Morrison's Fresh Cooking, leading to its sale to Piccadilly Cafeterias in 1998. Let's enter the rich history of Orange Julius, an iconic American chain celebrated for its signature frothy fruit beverage. Originating in the late 1920s, envision the vibrant atmosphere of bustling shopping malls, where Orange Julius stores became synonymous with this refreshing drink. Don't you love it when everything falls into place? Like how the world-famous Orange Julius Smoothie Shop now fits so perfectly inside your DQ. The story commenced in 1926, when Julius Freed opened an orange juice stand in Los Angeles, California. Initially modest in scale, with daily sales of around $20, a significant breakthrough occurred in 1929 when Bill Hamlin, Freed's real estate broker, devised a formula to enhance the appeal of the acidic orange juice. This innovation resulted in a frothier, creamier texture that captivated customers, catapulting daily sales to $100. The popularity of Orange Julius surged during the 1950s and 1960s, extending to various outlets, including state and county fairs and standalone Orange Julius stands. Beyond being a beverage destination, the original stand offered medicinal tonics and Bible tracts. The recognition as the official drink of the 1964 New York World's Fair solidified its status in culinary history. In 1967, Orange Julius changed ownership, transitioning to Al Lappin Jr.'s International Industries Corporation, heralding a new era of expansion. With 745 franchises spanning from California to Canada, the company evolved into Orange Julius International. In 1987, it joined forces with International Dairy Queen, ultimately becoming a wholly owned subsidiary of Berkshire Hathaway, led by billionaire Warren Buffett. Orange Julius thrives as a featured menu item at Dairy Queen stores, known as treat centers. Wondering why those culinary gems from Britling cafeterias have vanished? Stick around for the reveal. Breitling Cafeterias, a successful chain of cafeteria-style restaurants, originated in the late 1920s as a prominent culinary presence in Birmingham, Alabama. The cafeteria was owned by John H. Holcomb and expanded to downtown Memphis, Nashville, and Louisville, creating a culinary alliance under common ownership in later years. Despite their local fame in Birmingham and Memphis, including B&W Cafeterias and Blue Boar Cafeterias, these establishments now only exist in the pages of culinary history. 
the 1st Avenue North location in Birmingham and the 20th St. North location in Memphis, both vibrant hubs in the late 1940s, encapsulated the essence of Britling's heyday. These cafes were beloved gathering spots, featuring live music in Birmingham and employing Gladys Presley, the mother of rock and roll legend Elvis Presley in Memphis. As the 1970s unfolded, the chains faced challenges from the rise of fast food establishments, prompting a move to suburban locations to regain their former popularity. However, the trend of all-you-can-eat buffets in the 1980s proved a temporary solution. Today, only memories remain as the once-thriving Britling cafeterias succumb to changing culinary preferences. Established in 1927 by Polish immigrant William J. Bresler, Bresler's 33 flavors impacted American cuisine. In 1954, the venture diversified by entering the fast food realm with Henry's Hamburgers, providing patrons a multifaceted experience. We put the fast in fast food since 1987, the Bresler's empire underwent a significant transformation becoming part of Oberweiss Dairy in Aurora, Illinois. At its peak, the chain boasted an impressive 300 stores with 297 thriving franchises. In 1989, responding to changing trends, Bresler's 33 flavors rebranded as Bresler's Ice Cream, expanding its offerings to include frozen yogurt to compete with the growing popularity of TCBY. A pivotal moment occurred in 1995 when Cool Brands, the parent company of Yogan Fruz, acquired the brand, leading to global expansions in Israel and Egypt. However, in 2007, Cool Brands bid farewell to the last remnants of Bresler's, rebranding the remaining five locations. This marked the end of a poignant journey of flavors and entrepreneurship that once adorned mall scenes across America. Reflecting on the mention of Bressler's 33 flavors, how many memories does it evoke for you? Once a prominent figure in the American dining scene, York Steakhouse, a nationwide chain of steakhouse restaurants, made a lasting impression on taste buds across the United States. We for a great lunch at a great price? Well, York has lots of them. At York Steakhouse, we serve the best in food and quality. During its peak, this culinary gem was part of the General Mills family. And by 1982, it had expanded to nearly 200 locations across 27 states, from the southern charm of Texas to the northeastern allure of Maine. The late 1970s and early 1980s marked the pinnacle of York Steakhouse's popularity, creating an inviting atmosphere that resonated with steak enthusiasts nationwide. However, the winds of change were unkind in 1989, most of its locations closed their doors. The post-1989 era brings a sense of mystery to the fate of the remaining York Steakhouse chain. While one account suggests a transition to Uno Restaurant Holdings Corporation, conflicting reports hint at an alternative path, a 1989 sale to the USA Cafes Incorporation, a significant franchisee of Bonanza Steakhouses for a conversion into the Bonanza brand. Primarily situated within shopping malls, these establishments featured a distinctive cafeteria-style layout. A culinary symphony unfolded with cold and hot items on opposite sides culminating at the cashier. The decor, a tribute to timeless elegance, showcased subdued lighting, substantial wooden furniture, and iron chandeliers. The York Steakhouse experience was more than just the delicious food. It was a journey through a unique ambiance. Patrons participated in a cafeteria-style procession, selecting items with a la carte pricing. Notably, tipping was discouraged at these establishments, but the humble butter and sour cream pat incurred an additional charge. Maryland, Chicken George emerged as a prominent fast food destination in the culinary scene of Baltimore. Theodore Holmes, an entrepreneurial visionary, laid the foundation for this flavorful venture in November 1979, opening the first restaurant in the bustling Mondalmin Mall. Chicken George is the official fast food chain of the Miss Intercontinental Pageant. What started as a single eatery evolved into a chain that left a lasting impression on the palates of its patrons. As the enticing aroma of Chicken George's delicious offerings permeated the air, the chain's popularity skyrocketed. 
Baltimore witnessed the establishment of five more locations, each contributing its unique flavor to the city's culinary landscape. The appeal extended beyond city limits, with Chicken George expanding to Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, and the bustling streets of Washington, D.C. The success reached distant places, with franchise restaurants appearing in Atlanta, Los Angeles, and various other cities. However, the culinary journey unexpectedly turned in September 1991 when Chicken George confronted financial challenges. Once riding high on the wave of success, the company faced the harsh reality and made the tough decision to file for bankruptcy with the ultimate goal of dissolution. The story of Chicken George is one of entrepreneurial spirit, flavor, and the ever-changing dynamics of the fast food industry. Were you intrigued by the tales of Chicken George? Get ready for the next shocking revelation. Situated in New England, Brigham's Ice Cream holds a special place as a beloved brand, reflecting the region's diverse culinary heritage. Originating in Newton Highlands, Massachusetts, Brigham started as an ice cream provider and a complete restaurant franchise. The delightful offerings of Brigham's Ice Cream made their way into court containers, bringing joy to the people of New England. The brand adorned franchised restaurants throughout Massachusetts for years, becoming integral to the local culinary landscape until 2013. Following its acquisition by H.P. Hood, the brand's headquarters established itself on Kimball Lane in Linfield, Massachusetts, reconnecting with its origins. What distinguishes Brigham's is its steadfast dedication to regional identity. By incorporating local flavors, the brand uses New England colloquialisms like Wicked to emphasize extremes and Frappe for a milkshake with a scoop of ice cream. Events significant to New Englanders, such as the Big Dig and the 2004 World Series, contribute to Brigham's story. While once having a significant presence with 100 restaurant locations, Brigham's eventually saw the end of its dine-in establishments. Since 1914, Brigham's has survived through World Wars, the Great Depression, to today's ice cream wars. The company has established itself as a New England tradition. The final stronghold in Arlington, Massachusetts, bid farewell to Brigham's name in August 2015. Nevertheless, Brigham's spirit endures, as its iconic ice cream is now overseen by Hood, ensuring that each scoop continues to embody the essence of New England's sweet traditions. In a world where tastes evolve and trends shift, Brigham stands as a timeless tribute to regional pride. But wait, there's more. Located in downtown Boston, Durgan Park was a living testament to history and gastronomy, gracing 340 Faneuil Hall Marketplace since 1827. Recognized as a landmark since 1,827 inches by the Greater Boston Convention and Visitors Bureau, this esteemed establishment became an iconic destination within the vibrant Quincy Market. With entrances on both its Faneuil Hall and Clinton Street facades, Durgan Park was not just a restaurant, but a time capsule of culinary heritage. In the face of changing culinary trends, Durgan Park confronted an unavoidable transition. On January 3, 2019, a significant announcement reverberated through its historic halls. January 12, 2019 would signify the final day of service. With a heavy heart, the doors closed permanently, leaving behind a legacy etched in the annals of Boston's rich history. However, a semblance of continuity endured amidst the closure. A satellite location at Boston's Logan International Airport continued to welcome patrons, preserving a taste of Durgan Park's legacy. Durgan Park was more than a restaurant. It was a revered institution where history and flavor converged. Wondering where Hamburger Hamlet disappeared to? Well, here is the tale. Hamburger Hamlet, affectionately referred to as The Hamlet, transcended its status as a restaurant chain to become a significant cultural landmark in Los Angeles. Established in 1950 by film actor Harry Lewis and his wife Marilyn, it swiftly became a beloved spot for Angelinos and the city's creative community. Starting as a single establishment, it expanded to 24 locations, influencing not only Los Angeles, but also Chicago and the Washington, D.C. metro areas, forming a hub of diverse flavors and artistic inspiration. The appeal of Hamburger Hamlet went beyond the ordinary by offering hamburgers with unique toppings such as the famous bacon cheeseburger with Russian dressing. Diners delighted in the little fried onions, 
a renowned side dish synonymous with the Hamlet experience. Tables adorned with tomato relish and a menu featuring more than just burgers, including omelets and Mexican dishes, contributed to the restaurant's eclectic charm. In 1987, the Lewises entered the upscale dining scene with the establishment of Kate Mantellini. A turning point occurred in 1997 when Cuckoo Roo acquired 14 Hamlet locations for $33 million. Noteworthy figures like Peggy Lee and Alfred Hitchcock frequented Hamburger Hamlet, immortalizing it in Hollywood biographies. The closure of the Sunset Boulevard Hamlet in 2014 marked the end of an era, symbolizing the passing of old Hollywood glamour, as expressed in Matthew Spector's novel American Dream Machine. In 2014, Los Angeles Magazine captured the sentiment in Alison Martino's article, Vintage Los Angeles, The Tragedy of Hamburger Hamlet. The piece resonates with the collective memories of a city, portraying Hamburger Hamlet not merely as a restaurant, but as a cultural cornerstone interwoven into the fabric of Los Angeles's rich history. The tale doesn't end here, though. There's more. Established in 1948 by the ice cream expert Earl Swenson, whose skills blossomed during his service in the U.S. Navy in World War II, the story of frozen delights commenced on the busy streets of San Francisco. Swenson's first shop, situated at the corner of Union and Hyde Streets, emerged from the remnants of a failed ice cream parlor, swiftly becoming a go-to spot for frozen treats. Earl, a devoted fan of vanilla, crafted an impressive array of 150 flavors, all presented under the banner of good as father used to make. The initial store, a modest spot with takeout service, gradually transformed. Swenson's franchisees expanded indoor seating and diversified the menu to include sandwiches and hamburgers, contributing to the brand's prosperity. Despite changes in ownership and various challenges, Swenson's endured. The brand persisted from its peak of 400 stores in the 1980s to a more scaled-down era in the 1990s. The journey included acquisition, a surge in popularity in Asia, and a poignant farewell to the last U.S. franchise in 2022. Today, under the ownership of International Franchise Incorporation in Canada, Swenson's legacy lives on with approximately 300 franchise outlets worldwide. From the charming streets of San Francisco to the bustling cities of Asia, Swenson's continues to spread joy with its delightful treats.